I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. Check out our new website at insightnews.com. Shed no blood tonight. Can't you see what the politicians do and how they make the case? You may say peace to me, I may say assalamu alaikum to the world is now. What are we all waiting for? As we go directly to our host, Al McFarlane. Thank you, Wayne. Good morning. I'm Al McFarlane. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. Uh, broadcasting today from the SPNN studios in St. Paul. We're glad to be here. We're glad that you're watching uh, this program and listening to it on KFAI. You may be connecting with us through uh, internet, through social media. We want you to do that and to share this with your media uh, environment, with your uh, contacts. Today, we wanna focus on uh, an area that we think is underreported but vitally important to the health and well-being of a community. I'm pleased to have uh, a uh, commissioner for the Minneapolis Park Board, uh, Commissioner at Large Latricia Vital, recently elected to the Park Board, Minneapolis Park Board, along with her Mary Merrill. She's the interim superintendent for the Minneapolis Park Board, and she's been a leading advocate, manager, uh, director of the Park Board, a great career of being a steward of the public parks. Also, Don Summers, she's Director of Communications for Minneapolis Park Board. And I wanna thank all of you for being here. Commissioner, let me start with you. Uh, congratulations on your election, first of all. Thank you, and thank you for having me. And talk about uh, why you chose to run for, to get the citizens of Minneapolis to support your vision, uh, and how they responded in electing you. So I decided to run because I was a young person who grew up in the parks in Minneapolis. I grew up with a single mom, a brother, and a sister, and the parks were the place for us to go. Um, I never knew why, but my mom would take us to parks every Saturday morning. We'd go at 8, 9 in the morning, and we'd come home probably 9, 10 p.m. And as adults, we had a conversation and asked her, why did we always go to the parks? And her answer was simply, it was free. It was something to do. Mm -hmm. I didn't have money to go to the movies all the time, so we had fun at the parks. Mm -hmm. And so when I saw that there was a gap in representation for women, particularly women of color who were running, I thought, now's the time. I might as well, now or never, and I stepped out there and just did it. Think back to the uh, process you just described, being a family, understanding the value, utilizing the service, feeling like, this is your place. Yes. And how has that changed, if it has changed, in the re recent years? Let me say that I, I think that uh, there's been a period of time where a lot of ordinary people don't have the same connection to the parks, and they don't feel like they are as welcome. Uh, maybe I'm reading it wrong, but I'm just throwing it out there. You are reading it correct, mm -hmm. and that is one of the reasons why I ran, because if you grew up with the feeling of this park is yours, I'll give you an example. When I went to Minnehaha Falls as a kid, mm -hmm. that was like going on a vacation. Uh -huh. That was an adventure. But North Commons felt like mine. Mm -hmm. Willard Park felt like mine, because I grew up in North Minneapolis. And so for me, that was the beginning of a gap. To go in a different neighborhood and see different amenities was 
enlightening to me. I, I didn't understand why the amenities were different. I just appreciated what I had. And so I work regularly with youth in North Minneapolis, and I've never heard a young person speak about parks how I felt about parks. So I knew there was a gap. And when I began having conversations with them, they went to parks for very different reasons. We went for dances. We went for tubing, snowing, all these things. They went just to sit there. Mm -hmm. And they didn't feel welcome in some spaces at all. And a lot of parents didn't connect the parks with daycare either. A lot of single parents didn't connect our park system with the way uh, for your kids to get some activities. Mm -hmm. I mean, I went to the parks for food. A lot of people don't think of parks as, as a place to go for food, mm -hmm. but I knew I was gonna get a great lunch all summer. <laughs> I knew I was gonna get great snacks. So the parks essentially was a part of my village, mm -hmm. and I saw that that was something that's missing nowadays. And after having conversations, it was definitely confirmed that communities of color don't feel the same way about parks that I grew up feeling about parks. So let's put that in a different context that that comment you're making now. The times have uh, rendered a different feeling towards young people. Maybe young people seeing themselves differently from when you saw yourself as a young person when I saw myself uh, commissioner or superintendent when we were young. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a clear idea of you know our role as young people but there has been a you know, storied disconnect Yes. Uh, between young people and uh, their sense of who they are. I think we've come through a period where, you know, for a while, uh, young boys and girls, young boys in particular were saying, black boys, you know, I hope I live to be 18, or I hope I live to be 20, or I, I want to have a baby so that there is something left of me because I don't expect to be here. So there's been this period of desperation and despair in the black community. Uh, and so how ought organizations like the parks that were bedrocks, you know, for us when we grew up, uh, how do they reconfigure themselves to be as relevant and engaging so that the kids don't see themselves or feel they're being seen as a problem, but they are seen as both assets and owners of the enterprise of community. What do you think? So the first thing is, is that people have to feel welcome. Young people, old people, whomever has to feel welcome. You made a good point that a lot of young people feel like they're either gonna be harassed mm -hmm. in some parks or you know, I, they just don't feel comfortable. So I think what we really need to look at as an organization is how we capture certain groups of people, rather that's young people or older people. What activities, what amenities, what things we do, what do we offer to these people to lure them back in, to understand that this is a warm, welcoming place for them? I think that begins with community engagement. I think that begins with us as an organization reaching out to those underserved communities and saying, hey, we want you, come to us, you know, and really taking the time to listen Mm -hmm. Not to tell them what we want to do for them, but to tell us, for them to tell us what we can do for them. Mm -hmm. I think that's how it starts. You're part of an exciting new class of commissioners. Describe some of your colleagues. You've got a great board, a great team. Yes. Uh, I think our city responded by choosing excellent candidates, and you are among them. But talk about the team. I think it's a unique opportunity. Uh, it is. It's a game changer. We have a very we have a very diverse group. We have our um, very first Somali commissioner. We have um, A. K. Hassan. A. K. Hassan. We have Commissioner Londell French, who's an African American man. Myself, an African American woman. We have um, Kel Severson, who represents North Minneapolis, who's a North Sider, mm -hmm. who's been in North Minneapolis mm -hmm. his entire life, who is at I, North I High School. I can tell you, I interviewed Kale. And my impression, I thought Kale was a black guy. He's not. I was looking at him. I said, <laughs> I said Kale, you know, and I'm looking at him. And the, but that such, says something about the beauty of us when we see that you, you know, I'm identifying you as a black guy. Right. He's not. I didn't know it, but I thought he was. I always joke and said, he knows the secret words. <laughs> <laughs> so if you question it, you're yeah. like, but he just said that. Yeah. So. Well, we talked about my people, my, yes. my neighbors, yes. my cousins, yes. but it's a good thing. Right. And, and, and really that reflects the reality of who we are, how we all are connected. Right, how and, we're family. Yeah, it's family, Absolutely. It's not, it's not yeah. ultimately, it's not about race. It's yeah. about what are you gonna do for our community? How are you gonna lift us up? And if you're a part of that community, you should be lifting us up higher, exactly. right? Kel 
is a north sider. Right. We have expectations of him as if he is a black man, mm -hmm. no matter what color yep. his yep. skin is. Yep. And I think that anyone who voted for us should hold us accountable, no matter what. I don't want to pass because I'm a black woman. Mm -hmm. I want you to be harder on me. Mm -hmm. I want you to be frank with me. I want you to say, listen, I can have the conversation with you that I can't with others mm -hmm. because that is out of my element. So I want people to be upfront and frank and honest with me. I've worked in North Minneapolis for 15 years. I want people to treat me just like they have mm -hmm. at Cub Foods mm -hmm. when I don't want to be bothered. <laughs> let, let, let me switch to uh, the superintendent, Mary Merrill. I know you as Mary Merrill Anderson. What right, do you prefer? Right, right. Um, either is fine, okay. but Mary Merrill's. Mary Good. Merrill. Mm -hmm. so, so thank you for being here. You've got a history with um, the Minneapolis Park Board. I and do. I'm going to ask you to detail that, but you've been a champion and an advocate and employee uh, commissioner. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've been sort of uh, through the entire enterprise, mm -hmm. uh, serving, representing, creating opportunity. Uh, tell your story, your relationship with the, the Park Board, uh, how you've become the interim superintendent, but what you've done in the past with the organization. Well, I started out um, at Powderhorn Park. I was a fresh out of college and looking for a job. <laughs> and uh, the city was offering this as an opportunity. So I uh, was hired at Powderhorn Park and they hired me at Powderhorn Park, which if you know Powderhorn is a 65 acre uh, booming park, really a diverse community. And I was fresh out of college and they had the nerve to put me there. <laughs> it was one of those kind of sink or swim kind of situations. I was fortunate to have a supervisor that never said no never really said I'd come with ideas. You know what, I, I want to open seven days a week. Open, okay, Mary, if you want to you be there, <laughs> open seven days a week. You got the keys. Right. Open up. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I was fortunate and it allowed me to grow. And um, as I progressed through the system, I became training coordinator, so really was able to um, be in a position to talk about what were those skill sets mm -hmm. that staff needed to be successful in uh, delivering services to the community. Uh, then I was in charge of all the rec centers in the whole city. Uh, then I was in charge of recreation, including adult sports, uh, and ultimately became superintendent. On my way up, um, there were some you know, real critical issues that we were dealing with, mm -hmm. issues around youth, the same issues that we're facing today. They're not new. They're not new, mm -hmm. they're not new, unfortunately. And what we found was, um, some of our park sites were actually um, almost recruiting grounds for, for certain gangs. Mm -hmm. I mean, they would come in and they would start recruiting the youth like, you know, like they were, you know, uh, um, you were going to sign up for the army or something. So we said we had to do something different. We had to really begin to figure out how we were going to engage the our youth. image just pops up. They were setting mm -hmm. up job fairs. Yes. Job fairs yes. At, the, at the park. Yes, okay. absolutely, okay. absolutely. So we created, one of the programs that we created, first we started dealing with uh, youth unemployment. Mm -hmm. So we, we set up Team Teamworks, a youth employment program. But we set it up differently. We set it up so there was a, they were in a team and there was some adult leadership, someone who could model the kind of behavior, the kind of skill sets um, that could really work with youth. And then we said we had to have someone who would refer those young people in so that we could have uh, a number of adults working to make that first employment experience successful for that youth. Mm -hmm. So it could be a school, a counselor, school teacher, a center director. Someone needed to say, this child needs to be engaged and needs to work this summer. Mm -hmm. And so that's how that program was set up, a little differently than what we usually did with youth uh, employment. We also then created Youth Line. The idea was that there was someone out in community who was working reaching out to young people, not assuming they were going to come to the park all by themselves, but someone who would meet them where they were and say, come on with me, I got something I think mm -hmm. you'll enjoy. Mm -hmm. And then to set up the program in the center so that it was meeting some needs, you know, that had a little pizzazz. Uh, they, it was programs that, you know, there needed to be a little risk and adventure in the program, as well as survival skills. So we really set that out to be someone outreaching, but then when they got to the park, there was something there to hold them. Mm -hmm. something that would uh, pique their interest. Um, beyond that, we knew that uh, we had young children at our parks. Sometimes you would have a, a seven-year-old watching a four-year-old. Mm -hmm. And so we needed to deal with that. So we created Recreation Plus, mm -hmm. which was a, a after-school program, child care program. And it was modeled on, we had a certain set of programs 
that the taxpayers were providing, but those children weren't often able to either get to the park or if they got to the park, they had other responsibilities. So we um, set that program up so they could take advantage of the program. So whether it was dance or tap and ballet or creative uh, uh, arts, whatever it was, they could come in and be a part, have those classes and the schools, I went and talked to at that time, Richard Green, mm -hmm. I said, we need your help. Mm -hmm. He said, what do you need? He said, we need buses. We'll get, we'll get you those buses. And he was right there on target with us. So we had the bus to the parks and then parents could come at, you know, walk down to the park after uh, they got off work or whatever and pick the kids up. So we were constantly looking at what were the needs in the community and how could we respond from a recreation and park standpoint. So that was kind of my history um, coming up and ultimately becoming superintendent, thinking about what I call the unfinished agenda mm -hmm. and that was providing access to the river on the north side. Mm -hmm. And so we moved our offices up on, uh, up on the river on mm -hmm. the north side and uh, even brought our park police up there so that we could um, focus the vision, say, look at the river. We need to be able to have access on the north side, just like we have on the south side. I can't remember where you were before. Where was the office before? I don't, I forgot. Downtown. Downtown, okay. Yeah, that yeah. wasn't necessarily, it was kind of controversial okay. when we did it, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, you made the right decision. Where you are now is mm -hmm. a, a wonderful place. It's mm -hmm. the right place, and it, mm -hmm. it does support your bringing focus mm -hmm. to the amenity, mm -hmm. uh, and the river represents uh, a huge uh, amenity, but it also uh, is uh, emblematic of uh, spaces like yes. that throughout the city. Mm -hmm. I, I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. I'm talking with Mary Merrill. She's the interim superintendent of the Minneapolis Park Board. And uh, Latricia Vital is a newly elected Park Board Commissioner. We'll have joining the conversation after the break, Don Summer. She's director of communication for Minneapolis Park Board. And what I want to do in the next segment is uh, sort of uh, go through maybe, Don, the wide variety of programs. What kinds of things uh, uh, are being offered to the residents and visitors to Minneapolis at the Minneapolis Park Board? Because I think people don't know the full breadth of opportunity. And how do we figure out ways so that we continually cultivate awareness and engagement? That's one thing. And then in the third segment, I want to talk about the business. Uh, the parks is a big budget organization. And as a business owner, as an African-American business owner, uh, I'm one of those that's encouraging uh, all of our public institutions to follow the lead of the governor in insisting that there is equity and parity in utilization of a minority owned businesses where it makes sense. So we'll talk about all of that. Stay tuned. I'm Al McFarland. Wayne? I want to go to the park Play till way after dark Have fun with my friends We can stay well or win Come on back to the north side I used to live over there. Come on back to the north side, south side, east side, west side, play in the park for sure. Check out our new website at insightnews.com. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome back to Conversations with Al McFarland. The music of my brother Wayne McFarland. Wayne, thank you again. You know, you've got a history with the parks as well. You've played for different events around town. Yeah. And uh, the parks mean so much to us as a community. I'm telling you, we've grown up in the parks as well. Uh, our band, Ipso Facto, we played Lake Harriet back in the day. And Shangoya, we played Lake Harriet. That was like, that was the hang. And then I played North Commons Parks for many events over the years. And, and uh, Juneteenth festivals, we've done that. I don't know for how long. Uh, as long as it's been, I've been there. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, you know, and I've always, the river is like my favorite, favorite place in the, in the United States. It, from all the way up at the Little Lake, all the way down to New Orleans. 
There we uh, go. So. There we go. So let me go to Don Summers here. Don, uh, you're director of communications for Minneapolis, and I wanted you to take the task of sort of explaining the breadth of programs so that our viewers and our listeners get a sense of how much uh, there is that can engage their interest and support their uh, health and well-being. Mm -hmm. The parks are about that, I think. Well, I think it's what draws people to Minneapolis. It what's drew, it's what drew me there as an employee. Uh, my kids grew up using the parks. Uh, they learned to drive a golf ball in Columbia. They learned to ride, ride bikes on our trails. And so recreation, I think, is such an expansive word. It's, there's the, um, most park systems, east to west coast, talk about programs, but there's also the facilities. I think of the, we have hundreds of multi-purpose athletic fields. We've got literally hundreds of playgrounds that kids play on. And so there's this free play that, that happens with, with people and families, and they're a, they're a source of, of neighborhood connections in many places, picnicking and so forth. And then there's the schedule programs, and I think those are the things that people sometimes don't know about. I think most people understand what's available that they can see, and they don't always think about what's available that are schedule programs behind the doors. And I think we've got a really committed and dedicated recreation division um, and environmental stewardship as well that does uh, nature and, and programs for kids and art and so forth. But when I think of the programs that, that I see and that I know are available, it really, it really is trying to provide access to families and kids mm -hmm. up through being seniors. I think of, I think of the, there's no, there's no, um, there's nothing they don't offer, to be honest. It's what, if you're a young parent looking for tot tumbling, or if you're somebody who's looking to get your child into a fundamental sports program, if you're a senior that suddenly started thinking maybe some yoga would feel good, you know, it's, it's Zumba. It's, uh, it, it's, it's really that, that breadth of program that they do. And in the recreation center, we've got 47 recreation centers. And I think people are surprised to learn that we have so many. Um, we've got parts of town. Um, we've got more, because of population basis, we've got more recreation centers in south and southwest than we do in north and northeast. Mm -hmm. um, they do a lot because of that. Our youth development program goes out and does a lot of pop-up parks where we don't have facilities. Mm -hmm. um, we've got our youth development team um, really focuses on teens. So out of our youth development division, and Mary knows a lot about this, of We've got a youth development department that does everything from child care, 6 through 12 child care, to um, our, our youth programs for teen teamworks. We employ about 250 teams, uh, uh, teens a, uh, a season. We've got uh, a lot of connections. I think, I think so often when I think of the programs for teens in the cities, whether it's night owls on Fridays and Saturday nights or if it's just being mentors the life skills that they try mm -hmm. to to connect with with our kids. Um, they, they do, we have a street reach program that's very effective. Again, as Mary said, it's not always about, please come to us because we think we're so wonderful. It's getting out in the community to make sure that they're connecting and, and making teens aware of what resources are available through the parks. So I think whether you're a, a family, um, whether you're an individual, or if you're in the later years of your life and you're looking for places to go, the, the, the breadth of what they provide that are trying to be affordable and accessible, I think is really impressive. Uh, I'm also really impressed they're going through Tyrese Cox, who is our Assistant Superintendent of Recreation, is leading a what's called RecQuest. So they have been going through a process over this past year of really going out, um, similar to how we did Closing the Gap in the NPP 20, the funding for neighborhood parks. They're going out and looking at what type of programming do we need at our recreation centers? And what type of amenities do we need at our recreation centers? Um, as you've all discussed earlier, the cities change a lot. The city was built in a time of really a homogenous kind of perspective, and it's, and it's changed. Our, we're turning tennis courts and football fields into soccer fields, and we're, we're doing a lot more programming to meet the needs of the communities. We've got 83 neighborhood communities, and really listening to what programs and what services they want, I think becomes really critical. And so RecQuest is a organizational effort to make sure that that happens. But I think that, I think that the type of programming is really, they're doing a much, they're trying to do a very focused effort to make sure that the programming that we're doing today is reflective of the communities that we serve and the needs of the community. And I think there's a lot of dedication and commitment to do that and I think that 
there's there's still work to do, but I think I, in the 12 years I've been there, I've seen it evolve, and I think it's going to continue to evolve. So, so let, me, let me ask you, you know, presume I'm a, um, a 15 or 14 or 18 year old, and, uh, and for some reason, I'm just not connected, not aware. Mm -hmm. What should I know? What would you tell me first? Uh, things that you think might be of interest that I should check out? Well, I think the, uh, my kids are older than that, but I, I think that uh, uh, the gyms, so that first of all, our gyms are, are just a hot spot. I was up at our new Northeast Recreation Center and all the kids from Logan have, are up there and the, and the gym was full. So gyms are, a per, are, are an important component. I would hope that if you're a 14 or 15 year old, I'm really gonna hope you've learned to swim. We're a city of lakes and we've got a lot of water resources and the, the drowning rates, what, I mean, it, it is a, it's a devastation when a, when a youth drowns. It's a devastation when an adult drowns, but a youth that, that doesn't know how to swim is, is, uh, is, is it really at risk. And so I think swimming lessons, we're really proud and we can talk more, Mary of, uh, or Latricia, of the new pool we're opening, the, the new Phillips pool, so swimming. But we've got, we've got, I think gyms are a big, uh, gyms are a huge draw in our sports programs. Mm -hmm. Our sports programs are a huge draw and I think our athletic division has really looked to and, and worked more closely with our, our staff to broaden those. We used to rely a lot on athletic councils and we're doing a better job if there aren't athletic councils in parts of town that we're still providing those athletic programs to, to, to teens. We've got a, a sound studio, a music studio that is still you know, underway. I think there's there's those little gems that people don't know about, um, but I think where we see the biggest use youth use of that age, that fourteen, that teen age, is really our sports programs, our athletic fields, um, our indoor facilities. Particular, we live in Minnesota, mm -hmm. so gyms become an important factor year round. But particular, some place where kids can go and be and gather and and. And play. I mean, who, who are the targets for your winter programming? You know, I look at uh, skiing, snowshoeing, mm -hmm. uh, the downhill or the cross country, or uh, what do you call it, uh, tobogganing, things like that. Uh, ice skating. Yep. Uh, I grew up uh, ice skating uh, in Worthington, Minnesota, uh, <laughs> is where I started <laughs> off here. And I tell my friend, I'm from Kansas City, but our family moved to Worthington way back when. And uh, we got into ice skating, and Wayne's an ice skater. I think all of us are ice skaters, right? <laughs> a roller skate, okay. I was an ice fisherman. Well, love ice skating, you know. Yeah. So, but that's something that a lot of our people just mm -hmm. hadn't gotten into. But here they do. Mm -hmm. We just don't elevate it enough or talk about it enough. So what, what about the winter activities? I know you guys know Anthony Taylor. Oh, yes. yes. And Taylor Big is fan. a fierce yes. advocate for getting our people to recognize mm -hmm that we have access to a phenomenal set of resources, particularly uh, in the winter, but also with the trails mm -hmm. and biking for the summertime. So what kinds of things, uh, uh, what do you do to get our people to feel like uh, the winter belongs to them as well? Well, I think that it's, it's providing the access and it's providing the, the, the services. So recreation centers, but those ice rinks, mm -hmm. and it's introducing them through programs particular teens, what we find is that if you learn to do it as a youth, you continue to do it. I bet you fished as a, as a youth. What you do as a, as a youth often translates into what you're doing as an adult, whether that's music or recreation or fishing. So for winter, one of our challenges is that, well, we have winters here and they're unpredictable. So ice, ice rinks, um, you know, I'm old enough to know that you always had firm ice by mid-December and we used to always be able to open our ice rinks by mid-December. Mm -hmm. That's a little more challenge. So make it, we're extending them longer. We're looking at how we do ice rinks. We're also trying to do more um, um, using community connections for rink access and making sure the rinks are in the right location. Our, our, our connection and our relationship with the Lopet has been transformative, I really believe. Um, Anthony Taylor and the Lopet Foundation of what they're pr trying to provide for winter recreation so a lot of our, our best resources these days are in Worth Park, the snowmaking. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to talk about cross-country skiing. It's harder if there's not good snow conditions and snowmaking makes that happen. And, and that's happening in North Minneapolis and Worth Park is amazing. And Anthony has really championed this effort to connect Northside residents of all colors mm -hmm. into that park. And teens and kids, you know, um, as somebody who snowshoes, I'm more of a snowshoer than a cross-country skier. I think the, I think the athleticism is a little lost on me, but 
it is, we're seeing more and more people of color, mm -hmm. but it, they have to be introduced to it. And they have to see people that look like them mm -hmm. on the ice rinks and on the ski trails and on the tobogganing hills. Let me tell you a story. You know. uh, when I first moved here, my brother Raymond and I were going somewhere. I didn't know the city of Raymond's one between me and Wayne. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't know where we were going. We were driving up Plymouth Avenue mm -hmm. and um, uh, drove kind of uh, towards the park. And you know, and Plymouth Avenue curves around, uh -huh. and then this chalet appears. Big, beautiful, magnificent building, yeah. right? This was back in the 60s, I think. Mm -hmm. And the minute I turned the corner and saw the chalet, I said, hold it. Panic <laughs> hit me. Because I think this must be a white neighborhood, and we probably shouldn't be here. It's likely will be stopped in question. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't the case. But there's this panic that I had, and it was real. I remember it. And it speaks to the uh, power arrangement or the caste uh, and color line mm -hmm. that characterize mm -hmm. our society. And so if I had that feeling as a 21 or mm -hmm. 2-year-old, how many other people feel that when, like mm -hmm. you were saying, you go to the parks, this is a public building, park building, but because there had not been a history of me feeling ownership of that enterprise, my first reaction is, I must be in the wrong place. Yes. Mm -hmm. what, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how, how do we make sure that nobody ever has that feeling again? What do you think? Well, I think, I think partnering and making sure that we're listening and, and, and partnering with the right people and making sure that we're providing the welcoming spaces that Latricia La and Mary mm -hmm. talked about. I think that if you don't feel welcome, you don't come. Mm -hmm. And to feel welcome, you, all, you need to see people that look like you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I think that through through really dedicated programming initiatives, through partnerships, and and I think that um, providing pro really it's really about providing those venues, and it's really about making sure that you're you're focused on making those changes, mm -hmm. and I and committed to making those changes. And I think that we strengthen our community engagement process, mm -hmm. right? Like we really figure out how to reach out to those underserved populations, whether it's African American, Latino, mm -hmm. Hmong, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, transgender population, whomever it is, we really have to think about how we are engaging them, um, rather that's media, rather that's face-to-face, -face, or services, because you, you talked about the LOPID and how they have these mm -hmm. great activities over mm -hmm. at Earth. I participated in them for um, lots of years, but this year as a commissioner, I went and it was a completely different experience. Mm -hmm. I was greeting a lot of the young people who were coming in from um, the cross country ski race and mm -hmm. I was surprised mm -hmm. by how many kids of color mm -hmm. crossed that finish line. Mm -hmm. It made me feel, mm -hmm. I don't even, I can't even explain how I felt. I, um, the Lopez provided a young man who's African American to kind of chaperone me around mm -hmm. during some of the festivities and it was just awesome. Like he talked about have an opportunity just like the wealthy kids did, mm -hmm. you know? And that was most important to him, the opportunity. Not that he came from North or wherever he came from. He was in the same space that the wealthy kids were and he had the same opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I think if that is the narrative that we look at, giving these young people an opportunity mm -hmm. to be great, that's what we should do as a system. We really need to look at how we create that opportunity, whether it's fishing, ice skating, uh, you know, skiing, whatever it is, we really need to think about that. When I think listening to the youth, one of the things, so we have a community engagement policy and, and it really drives how we do communication. I've been at the park board for 12 years. Our initial public meetings were held inside, oftentimes at rec centers, and they were full of white people. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, I can't say any more clear than that. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't how we're going to reach out to the community. So they've really looked at it, and, I, and it's really started being driven by our planning department. Because if you're going to build a playground, you need to hear from the, the community what they want. If you're going to build a new wading pool, what, what do they want to see in it? So they really started going out in our parks. And then two years ago, we started doing master plans. They're called service area master plans. And I, I think they become really creative. And to your point of making sure teens are part of this, so in North Minneapolis, what after, again, a couple of years of community outreach that didn't always reach who we wanted to outreach to, 
they really listened in North Minneapolis. They had grants that they, the community said, let us outreach to our community. Mm -hmm. We know who the people are. Let, let us talk to them on your behalf. Be part of our process. So they did that, serving food from North Minneapolis at our community meetings when you're having meetings in North Minneapolis. Uh, in Northeast, Southeast Minneapolis, they've got a whole teen division. They're, you know, teens use our parks. If you're not listening to the youth who are using them, you're missing out on a significant part of the population. So how are you making sure that you're providing those, those, those avenues and making them intentional to do it and, and learning? And I think it. maybe we're, uh, making sure that when they walk through that door, Mm -hmm. They understand that they are a very important person mm -hmm. yes. to us, that they are really welcome. Yes. And working with our staff to show them how to be, uh, to have that uh, uh, voice that says, you are a very important person because mm -hmm. you walk through our door. Yeah. I was going to say one of the other things, though, about um, winter programming is that a lot of uh, winter programming happens indoors. It's like hockey. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hockey used to be an out sport. Mm -hmm. It's essentially become an indoor sport because people want uh, to use the arenas. But um, I think we have to um, remember that both outside activity and a lot of times you're not going to introduce the young people to the outside activities until they've come in inside mm -hmm. and used kind of what they feel comfortable with. I know my grandson is hung up on his uh, Xbox and, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, put the Xbox down. Right, right, In right. fact, when, uh, when I was the assistant superintendent for recreation, I used to ban TVs in rec centers. I said, they didn't come here to watch, to watch TV. Mm -hmm. You know, you came here to participate in activities. Has so. that held up or not? Well, since I've been gone, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> I, I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. My guests uh, are Latricia Vital. She's a park board commissioner at large for the Mini Apples Park Board, newly elected, uh, a fierce leader uh, in the community, and I think a, a, a powerful voice of leadership, uh, part of a new class at the commission. Uh, Mary Merrill is the interim superintendent for the Park Board, and Don Summers is the director of communications for Minneapolis Park Board. When we come back, we're going to talk about uh, the enterprise, the business, and how you all have a responsibility for ensuring uh, uh, and at least considering what I would call economic justice. Okay, stay tuned. Let's go down to the river. Have a little fun tonight. Let's go down to our great river. Know that all Come down, we'll have some time. Have a grand old day. We're gonna love everything we do down the Mississippi way. Check out our new website at insightnews.com. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome back to Conversations with Al McFarland. My guest, Latricia Vital, she is Park Board Commissioner at Large for Minneapolis Park Board. Mary Merrill is the Interim Superintendent for the Minneapolis Park Board, and Don Summers is Director of Communication for Minneapolis Park Board. This has been a great conversation, and I think our goal here is met. We are attempting to share with our listeners and viewers the value proposition of the Minneapolis Park Board. But I want to take it one level deeper because I see you as a big business. Uh, government is a big business. And too often, citizens from our community look at government as them over there, up there, you know, somewhere else. And we don't have the connection, the sense of equity, and the sense of our power as voters even to direct uh, policy and practice. And so I think the enlightened leadership that is uh, in front of us at many levels right now, including this park board, is a leadership that is committed to discussing and acting on the principle of equity and engagement. So uh, superintendent first, can you give me a, an idea, give the audience an idea of how big a business is the Minneapolis Park Board? Well, we're a $90 million operating budget with the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. We have probably a $20 million capital program. 
And so um, it is big business. Mm -hmm. We have an enterprise of about 10 million. So um, it's, it's, um, it's a big business. In enterprise, I mean our business side. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. So you're generating revenues of 10 million. Right. In, in, in income. And so the question becomes how much of that business is flowing through uh, communities of color? And you might not, I didn't prepare you for the question. <laughs> if you don't have the answer, it's fine. But just have a general discussion with me so we have a sense of how you're looking at it and where things might go in the future. Let me just say this. Um, I think in the past, um, Communities of color had very little involvement, but I think we're really, that's changed. Mm -hmm. And as I've come back, we have um, people who are, are now being invited up to the new uh, Worth Park and the, where the Lopet is, there's going to be the Cajun Twist, which is a uh, restaurant that will operate out of there. That's an African American owned African American owned business. I've, I've heard about it. Already. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm going to say we have Lewis King, who's doing some uh, work both at the Northeast uh, Water Park, mm -hmm. Jim Lupian Water L Park. Lola's was his. Lola's, yeah, yes. A great idea. Yeah, and at uh, Bede Makaska. Mm -hmm. So I think that opportunities are opening up. It doesn't mean that it's enough, mm -hmm. but it's a beginning. And uh, we're committed to continue to expand and open up our business line, whether it's in golf, mm -hmm or whether it's in the, um, what we used to call refectories, now restaurants out in the parks, uh, in the regional system. So those are some of the things, but there are other areas where we, you know, we order lots and lots of supplies, mm -hmm. uh, lots and lots of um, equipment, um, uh, vehicles. There's all kinds of things that we are procuring and we are beginning to open up, they've developed this equity lens to look at everything that we do in the organization, we need to be looking for how is it uh, engaging or um, how is it connecting with communities of color as well as the total community. So, Commissioner, what do you see as a, a strategy from the uh, oversight point of view, from the policy point of view, uh, to expand uh, and ver further uh, demonstrate the notion of equity and inclusion? And so I think that um, what I learned in coming into this position is that everything we do at the park board is measured by our equity matrix, mm -hmm. right? And so that means that some of these things you brought up around business is going to change, mm -hmm. that um, we have an opportunity to provide more funding for communities of color. We have how many, Don, six restaurants um, maybe in the parks? I'm not sure if that number is correct. Um, five or six, <laughs> and now we have Lewis King, who is the first, him and his wife are the first African-American um, vendors at uh, the most visited park in the city, right? But Dame Acosta is where everyone goes. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is just the beginning of something that we'll see different. I think we're looking at how we have um, communities of color represented at the concerts, music in the parks. Like, we can't only think of food, we'd have to think of everything. If we want this space to be so, uh, safe, welcoming for everyone, then I want to see my band at the band shelled as well, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not my space if I've never heard of them, if they don't look like me, if I can't jam to the music they're playing. So we're looking at opportunities to have diversity all around the board so we can all jam together. It's not about one group or the other. We are really looking at how we mix it up in these communities, how Powderhorn is not just serving one place but serving everyone. And I think we're just starting. I think we're, we're on the road to success, but I think we, we are looking at everything um, through that equity lens, and it's guiding our work, and I think we'll, we'll get there so sooner than later. tell me how later. the equity matrix works. So, so all of the projects are basically like rated on a scale through the, the, through the matrix, mm -hmm. and so they get a priority based on like, the way I can explain it is like priority basically. Mm -hmm. So like right now, some of our parks, some people think like Northside parks are the worst parks, but Riverside has some of the worst parks. So because it went through that equity matrix, we understand that 
this is where the priorities are, mm -hmm. right? Like it's not about amenities, it's about maybe the roof needs to be fixed or maybe the door handles are 70 years old. I don't know how old some of these recreation mm -hmm. centers are. But um, yeah, so it's just kind of, it guides our work. It, mm -hmm. it tells us what's the priority and what can happen in 2020. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, go ahead. Though. Just to see if I can expound on that. So part of the, the neighborhood park plan, which is $11 million a year that we get to invest in, specifically our neighborhood parks, not mm -hmm. our regional parks. And the, the equity matrix she's referring to, that really launched that into the forefront. So the it's both park characteristics and community characteristics. So the racially concentrated areas of poverty, youth populations, we were talking earlier about how we're serving our, serving our youth. We've got pockets of the city that are very heavy in youth, and we've got pockets of the city that aren't. So each of our parks, each of our 160 neighborhood parks have been rated through this very objective rating system mm -hmm. to say what's been invested in it, what, what hasn't, what is a... So there's park characteristics and there's neighborhood characteristics. Mm -hmm. And the higher the rating, the, the higher priority it is for them, you know, to, or the, the right. lower the, the rating, lower the, rating the, the higher, higher the priority. priority. And so that started with our neighborhood parks. That was in 2016. So we started implementing that in 2017. In 2017, they applied that same. Now we have regional parks have an equity matrix applied to it of where we're spending our money. So the riverfront serving north and northeast. Which are what, the regional parks? Which, which are regional parks? The, I'm asking which are they? What, oh, what the, are they? The regional parks, if you think about it as the Grand Rounds, are our largest, the, mm -hmm. the Chain of Lakes, Minnehaha Falls, the river Park corridors. Lakes. Uh, Victory Memorial up in, and mm -hmm. up near Weber, North Mississippi mm -hmm. is a regional park. That's mm -hmm. where I live by, and mm -hmm. I love that park. And mm -hmm. so, regional parks are eligible for more state funding, and are re usually the recipients of more private okay. ph philanthropic funding. So, the equity matrix was first really used. Um, it kind of came out of our work with the Government Alliance on Racial Equity. It came out of our desire to do more engagement. That was our first equity matrix. They applied it first to neighborhood parks and they started applying it to regional parks. They've expanded that. Now our recreation center spending has a racial equity lens applied to it so that we are applying it to areas of, of greater need. Um, procurement, when you're speaking specifically about that, uh, if your viewers do not know this, they should. The city launched in January of 2017 something called the Target Market Program. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's really designed, any procurement for services or products under $100,000. Um, anybody within the city, both the city of Minneapolis and, and, any, and the park board, have to, anything under $100,000, you have to go through that. I can't, I can no longer just decide to spend my $5,000 or $20,000 over here. And it, it has a geographic target area to it. It's mm -hmm. really designed for small businesses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I keep talking to vendors. Yeah, I'm not aware of that. That's, that's are new, not aware it's of news it. to yeah. me. So I'm in the I, news business. I keep telling okay. people about yeah. it. So we now purchase all of the Minneapolis Park Board's procurements mm -hmm. have to go through that process. Mm -hmm. And it's really opened up who we're working with. Mm -hmm. So if you're, again, if I would really, it, it's online. If yeah. you look at the City of Minneapolis website and just look up Target Market Program, mm -hmm. you have to apply. And once you're on it, mm -hmm. if you are a small business printer in North Minneapolis, mm -hmm. You need to be on it because when I go to print something now, I develop my, my specifications, mm -hmm. I send it out, the city gives me the list mm -hmm. and I have to purchase off that list. Mm -hmm. And it's really opened up for small businesses. Um, and then I think the smaller thing I mentioned earlier, I think uh, it, it's the listening to and, and, and making sure you're aware of, of that desire. Uh, I think something as small as the, the purchasing food for our service area meetings in the neighborhood where you're holding service area meetings versus just going to an an easy contract, if you would. So, mm -hmm. I think that I think the park board has really taken the steps to try to look at using using racial equity lens of how we're looking at how we're buying things in general. You're going to say something. Um, actually, I was as I was as she continued to talk. She said what I was going to say, mm -hmm. but um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I was in fact I was going to talk about that. But uh, I think it's important, and then also as we look at um, our hiring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, we have, you know, we have a lot of employees and we have good jobs. Mm -hmm. They're good jobs mm -hmm. with good benefits. And so we're looking at that same kind of lens to make sure that we're recruiting from a, a really good, diverse group of uh, individuals. Because I always feel that the more diversity, um, the better. So and the more reflective, yeah. and, the, and the, the better. In the last couple of years, you had mm -hmm. some challenges, I think, though, didn't you? 
there was uh, press about uh, employment uh, opportunity and advancement. How, mm -hmm. how, how does that stand right now uh, as you see it? I, I think we're working on it. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the things that um, I've challenged the team to really think about is how we um, make these jobs appealing to young people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like what young person actually grows up and says, I want to work in the forestry department at the park. They really want to be these millionaire basketball players and soccer players. Mm -hmm. So I think we look at the Team Teamworks program and create opportunities for kids to work in IT maybe, human resources, mm -hmm. you know, under leadership, mm -hmm. so that it's not just, so that our community is not looking at parks as a place to clean trash up. Mm -hmm. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to do that. Mm -hmm. There are people, I shouldn't say nobody wants to do that, but that's not um, appealing to young that's people. Only, yes, that's uh, not the only thing yeah. that they and should. That's a good job, but it's mm -hmm. not the right. only job. Yeah. But right. it's not the only job. Yeah. The, the people who do that do well, mm -hmm. but I think we need to let um, young people know that there's other things you can do. You can have a great life by doing those things. You can give back to your community mm -hmm. by doing those things. And I think we start in our programming for young people mm -hmm. and we get there. That's mm -hmm. how we change that narrative of 20 years from now, we should be looking at the, looking back at this tape and saying, you know what, we did that and now look at the staff at the park board. I, I think um, you make a great point and we do have some people, we have, they're not a lot, but who've started at Teen Teamworks yes. and now are you know, crew leaders and foremen uh, within the uh, park board. So I think you are so correct in saying let's start with Teen Teamworks and other, times, uh, other kinds of employment that young people have at mm -hmm. rec centers mm -hmm. to say here are the careers that you can um, advance to. Here are the careers that if you prepare for them, you can be a, po a park police officer. Yes. Let's you talk know? about that. You, you got, you, are your officers sworn officers? I yes. Think? yes. Talk about that. It's a huge opportunity. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, a way, it's number one, a great job. Mm -hmm. It's a, a great career destination, but it's also a great pathway mm -hmm. if people want to move in other mm -hmm. arenas of law enforcement. Talk about that. I did a ride along this mm -hmm. past weekend <laughs> with our park police, and I was, I just didn't know that they did what they did, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I assumed all these years that park police only police the parks, mm -hmm. and that is not true. Mm -hmm. They are Minneapolis officers just like the MPD. Mm -hmm. And so we got and called. Tra and transit, right? And transit. transit has transit a little bit. Not. I'm not sure, but they mm -hmm. have jurisdiction. They have on the, Bus. the buses, mm -hmm. on the transit, the trains. Mm -hmm. Whereas Minneapolis Parks, like I'm riding in this car and we're getting calls about things going on in houses that mm -hmm. are not on Parkland. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, we do this? Mm -hmm. You know, it was great. It's an experience that most of us should have because it is a great career path for young people. If you're interested in law enforcement, rather you wanna move on to something else, I think it's a great place to, to make a living for yourself, to have a career, again, to give back to your community in the way that a lot of people want to give back. And well, just as uh, she was saying about the police officers, park police though have a different focus. And a lot of times they're in parks where positive what, you know, activities are happening, they can really engage with community. They don't always just see the, um, the bad. Yeah, the worst, of, you know, they're, yes. they're very engaged with community. I can remember park police officers uh, coming and, and uh, taking a child, not not, uh, but taking a child home and, and knocking on the door and mm -hmm. saying, "Your child had a problem tonight at the park, yes. mm -hmm. and we really want to correct that." I mean, they have the ability to do that kind of mm -hmm. work, so it's a really wonderful career, mm -hmm. a great opportunity. If you like people and you love people, yes. then you can also be a police right. officer. The, the police mm -hmm. officer I wrote mm -hmm. with, she grew up in North Minneapolis, mm -hmm. so she knew I mean, just everything she knew about the neighborhoods mm -hmm. in general, not just North, mm -hmm. but um, even the gas station. Mm -hmm. She stopped and checked in on people at the mm -hmm. Super America to make sure everything was okay mm -hmm. there. She knew uh, the best part about the ride was she knew that the ice castles or that the ice sculptures were over at Minnehaha Park and she's like, oh, I want to show you something cool. So we stopped and checked in at the, on the people over there. You know, so it, it was a lot of fun, yet you got to see how she served the community, mm -hmm. how it made her feel good. Um, about her place in the park system. And mm -hmm. I can add to that, the 
to Mary's point, it's community policing, and they take that very seriously. There's a reason less than 2% of the violent crime that happens in the city happens in the park. There is a, we have a presence, and they have the connections. They work, they, they work like this with our recreation center staff. They believe in, in being in relationship building. They're not, re, they're not just having to respond to calls. They are, they are there. In addition to our, I should mention, in addition to our sworn officers, we have agents. Yes. And as somebody who does training in, on media relations and, and, and social media each spring, our ability to, to mentor um, more diversity in our, our agents, I think they do a lot for recruiting. Yesterday, I happened to know this because my photographer was there. They had 15 kids. In addition to Teen Teamworks for, for career paths, um, in addition to Teen Teamworks, and they do several career days where all of our staff go forward and talk ITS, web, what happens. They had 15 kids from Career Pathways, mm -hmm. all these young teens walking through, learning what it's like to be a Minneapolis Park police officer awesome. and look at a car and see what their jobs entail. And it was it was a great mentoring opportunity. Yeah. I was we're, thinking we're, just, just... We're out of time. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, uh, but this has been a great conversation. Let me uh, thank you all. Uh, Mary Morell, Merrill, uh, Interim Superintendent for the Minneapolis Park Board, uh, Latricia Vital, Commissioner. Park Board Commissioner at Large for Minneapolis Park Board, and Don Summers, Director of Communication for Minneapolis Park Board. You know, so I want to tell you that uh, the uh, asset that you are stewards of is a tremendous and powerful resource for our community. I want to commend you for both your vision and your commitment to guaranteeing that we all have access and we can all understand, know, and feel at home. And I think that our shared vision is that our Com communities completely connect, mm -hmm. enjoy, build, support, and grow this asset. It means growing the best community that we can have. Yeah. Yeah, Thank absolutely. you all. I'm Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If I see you again, hope you stay, my friend. If I see you again. Talk about where I went. Well, my God told me the other day I was on my knees and I began to pray. Told him I need a little help tonight. Well, I think I'll go down by the river, sit and talk. I see you there, it's a full moon night. Here we go again. If I see again If I see you again Hope you'll be my friend Check out our new website at insightnews.com I'm just a cowboy I'm gonna come into your town Every time I see you you make my heart go wild Every time you kiss me You make me want to smile It's alright, it's okay I want to be that special lover today I want to be your cowboy, please